Uh, greetings, everyone. Welcome to day two of Mobility Outlook's E2 Wheeler Summit 2021. And like Atul said, what a fantastic day of deliberations, insights, and perspective we had yesterday. Very quickly, I'd like to give you a bit of a recap from yesterday's proceedings. We began with the inaugural session with Mr. Naveen Munjal, Managing Director of Hero Electric, delivering the inaugural address. Then we had Mr. Nagesh Basavanali, MD and CEO of Greaves Cotton, delivering the industry keynote, while Mr. Rajiv Singh, partner and automotive sector leader from Deloitte India, delivering the, a deeper insight into the E2Villa ecosystem. The E2Villa segment is set to take off, driven by policies, falling operating costs, change in demographics, and a growing B2B segment. Moreover, the opportunity offered by the upcoming smart cities that drive road infrastructure improvement, sustainability, and the startup ecosystem are the stimulants for the segment to grow. Later, we had a fascinating panel discussion with Mr. Sudendu Sinha, Advisor, Infrastructure Connectivity at Niti Aayog, Mr. Sohinder Gill, Global CEO, Hero Electric and DG SMEV, Mr. Arvind Sankar, co-founder of Repido, Mr. Jay Kumar Ji, the Group President and Managing Director of Valio India, Mr. Karthik Gopal, Senior EV Industry Specialist with the World participating in a panel that was moderated by Mr. Arun Malhotra, industry expert and former MD of Nissan Motor India, who collectively looked at the subject of Vision 2030, making E2-wheelers the norm in the country. While the panelists welcome recent developments, both policy-wise and investments-wise, they, they also cautioned uh, about the continuing challenges plaguing this sector. Apart from these, of course, we had a technical session on product and design with detailed presentations from representatives of HBK, ENSYS, ETAS Automotive, Aether Energy, and Dismania Design. Today, beyond this morning's panel, we have a technical session on battery and motors with presentations from Lucas TVS, Saita VNA, HBK, and Infineon Technologies. Thereafter, we have a special address from Ms. Mahua Acharya, she is the Managing Director and CEO of Convergence Energy Services Limited, an EESL enterprise. Later, towards the end, we will have a valedictory address by Mr. Chetan Maini, Founder and Vice Chairman of Sun Mobility, and a concluding address by Mr. Sohinder Gill from Hero Electric. Of course, now we are all set for the panel discussion on EV retail, developing an appropriate go-to-market strategy. And we are deeply honored to have with us Mr. Vinkesh Gulati, President Fada, Mr. Jitendra Sharma, Founder and Managing Director, Okinawa Autotech, Ms. Sulajja Firodia Motwani, Founder and CEO of Kinetic Green, uh, Ms. Prerna Chaturvedi, uh, Founder and CEO of Evolet, and this discussion will be moderated by Mr. Amit Kaushik, Managing Director of Urban Science India. To all the panelists, thank you for being part of this discussion. I wish all of you an enriching session. Good luck, Amit, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Vipanshu. Uh, and welcome, I cordially welcome you all uh, for this, for India's first two-wheeler EV summit to 2021. Uh, we have our distinguished panel here, uh, as Dipanshu has already uh, introduced. We will start with uh, this session, you know, slicing down this session into four pieces. Probably we will start with the, some of the demand drivers. Then we will get into some of those consumer behaviors and how consumer customer journey is happening around. Then probably get into the formats and finally the sustainability of, uh, of, of the formats and first sustainability of the, of the retail formats that you are going to adapt. So to start with, I will, uh, I will, I will, uh, uh, I will introduce, uh, 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 I will I will really thank uh, Sujata, Sujata Sujata especially for uh, for joining us and especially with her uh, you know kind of uh, not good health not so good health I really appreciate her her presence here. So Sujata, I think uh, to start with uh, with yourself uh, as of now you know uh, there are many things which are happening around and uh, in the recent past especially in 2021 has set up a new I would say stage for uh, electric two wheelers in India. First six months registrations have really surpassed the entire 2020, I would say the complete demand in a way. And uh, apart from the real registration that has gone into the system, which is visible to everyone, 
there are a lot of sales which are going, uh, which is not registered here. And of course, which is actually uh, coming from the low speed vehicles. So how do you see how this demand has triggered? What are the real demand trigger, demand drivers here in the recent past? And how this demand is going to sustain? And what are your preparedness for all, uh, all this demand going forward? So uh, Sujata, I'll start it with you. You're on mute, Sujata. Uh, good morning to everyone and to my fellow panelists as well. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, just to correct you, my name is Sulajja, not Sujata. It's a very difficult name, so everybody gets it wrong. Don't worry. I'm happy to be here in uh, encouraging this dialogue on electric two wheelers. Um, you know, I have. I would like to say that I think uh, in this year of 2021-22 uh, fiscal year, though we had the first two months of lockdowns across the country. But this year has begun on a very positive note for electrification of India's two-wheeler sector. Of course, the efforts have been going on for the last several years, uh, you know, with some policy initiatives being uh, started, uh, more players coming in the market, uh, you know, the initial seeding work. But I think what has happened in the recent times really has been, uh, I would say, uh, uh, transformative. Um, and there are two, three things why I am bullish. Uh, first of all, the new policy of FAME2, where the slab for electric two wheelers has been increased to 15,000 per kilowatt hour uh, with up to 40% as you know upfront incentive to the customers. I think what this will, this will do is really bring the price parity uh, you know, uh, in, in reality. So of course, electric two wheelers already had a lower TCO than ICE vehicles, but there was that initial sticker shock for the customers because they had to pay a little bit more upfront though of course they were paying for the battery. So apples to oranges comparison, but you know, customer is customer, so uh, they have their own ways of thinking. So with the higher slab, the purchase price parity is something that is totally within reach now. And I think this will be one um, turning point because while customers are environment conscious, they would like to do things which are uh, green. Uh, I think if something pinches their pocket, they will shy away from it. So at the same time, when petrol prices are going up, and prices of battery and therefore now with fame electric scooters are coming down i think that will be a real motivator for customers to consider it seriously so i think this is one very big input that has come second thing is that many important states have now come up with uh, ev policies including maharashtra yesterday as, as as recent as yesterday and almost all states have now waived registration costs rto taxes uh, and made it therefore more attractive for people to own electric two wheelers already the GST has been lower. So these inputs are very useful. Um, second thing that I think is happening is customer awareness, which also is an important turning point. Uh, we keep tracking intention to purchase. And you know, earlier people were just sort of, you know, looking at electric two wheelers, thinking about it, but the intention to purchase was very low. But now I see that people are considering electric two wheelers seriously, uh, and they will be looking at those as an option uh, and go for test rides. And once you drive an electric scooter, you, know, you always fall in love with it. An electric two wheeler, it has a wonderful uh, experience. So customers intention to purchase is something which is an important thing. The awareness is increasing. Um, thirdly, I think there are many more players coming in the market, uh, better quality products coming in the market, uh, which will also help the sector. So because of three, these three fundamental reasons, one is price parity, uh, second is uh, state support, and third is customer uh, awareness and intention to purchase and more players in the market. I think this is bringing the entire ecosystem together. At the same time, I feel that there are a few things which still have to be uh, done more on the ecosystem side, uh, which will really help for the numbers to take off. India is the world's largest two-wheeler market and the opportunity is huge, uh, but we need support from uh, the other players. I think first and foremost is auto component industry. Uh, now, I think they have kind of started looking at this sector seriously. Uh, they need to come forward and make investments and, you know, bring that uh, cost of the local components down. So, Atma Nirbharta and local technology for global leadership. This will really help the sector. Second, of course, is financials. Uh, though two-wheelers has been less of an issue, it's more three-wheelers which have had a problem. But more financials supporting electric two-wheelers, giving attractive schemes. Um, I think this will really help uh, the market. Um, third is also charging infrastructure, though, of course, most electric two wheelers have enough battery to go and charge at home. But if there's a public charging infrastructure at public places like offices, colleges, malls, shopping centers, you know, that will build the confidence amongst people that they can get charging when they need. 
So I think these three things uh, coming together with the increased confidence, awareness, price parity, uh, I'm sure that this is an inflection point uh, which we are looking at. And next 10 years, there'll be a lot of action on electrification of India's two wheelers. So very bullish. And uh, I think this year is starting on a good note. Thank you. Thanks, Sulecha. So you talked about awareness. So Mr. Gulati, coming back to you, uh, uh, Sulecha pointed out a very, very important point of awareness on the consumer side. So you work on ground. So how do you see, how do you see the difference between an electric vehicle customer compared to the ICE engine customer? So what is his expectations? What he expect from the retail experience point? What he expect from the, from the durability of the uh, product point? And what are other, is his overall experience, I would say, expectations from this emerging, I would say, uh, emerging innovation and uh, a new technological innovation which is happening around. Apart from the real challenges that he's already aware of those, those pricing parity, which is coming down now. And of course, uh, some of infrastructure issues, which to an extent is, is being addressed coming in with, you know, you can actually uh, charge your electric two wheeler uh, at your home using uh, those uh, 12 volt adapters and everything. So how do you see the overall behavior changing and how are they, they seeing this overall journey being, uh, being, being going forward on the, from the ground, from your perspective? Thanks, Amit. A uh, real important question for the electric two-wheeler being a mass product uh, uh, in the near future. So obviously, yes. Uh, but one thing you should consider, any person who comes to buy a vehicle, it is electric or non-electric, his main motto is uh, movement. So uh, when he comes to a showroom, his basic purpose is uh, affordability and uh, a better product as per latest technology. No doubt, uh, as of today, environment-friendly things are uh, seeing the green thing is in. So people are uh, talking about EV a lot. And like Sulaja ji said, uh, uh, before it was just a talk. Now it's actually converting into action. So uh, the kill ratio has increased uh, of the electric vehicles lately. And with the current uh, fame to change and the uh, Gujarat, Maharashtra joining the electric vehicle wagon, uh, we are confident that it will grow further but yes uh, there, there is a still a resistance there is still a hitch in uh, customers mind with a lot of uh, i'll say myths which is going on for this electric vehicle for the past five years things are changing if you talk of uh, charging stations uh, agreed two-wheeler charging stations are less to find but passenger vehicle trans uh, charging stations are growing uh, but overall, what, what is happening on the ground reality is that uh, the ICE two-wheeler dealers are still not promoting to electric vehicle two-wheelers because they are not able to sell them. So uh, we have a separate range of dealers who are selling electric vehicle and separate range of selling ICE. And there is no comparison because we have somewhat uh, 15,000 ICE two-wheeler dealers or outlets, whereas we talk of electric vehicle, it would be what, 400, 500, 600. That's it. And that too, it is specific to some major cities. So that's where the problem is. So normally, it, it, is, an, uh, it is also an inside, inside fighting. Because if I don't have an electric vehicle uh, to sell, so normally a salesman will try to dissuade you to go towards electric. So that's, that's one phenomenon, which, are, which I normally always say in all the panels, all the articles that... Uh, we have been taught when we came into dealership, jo dikta hai, wo dikta hai. and that was the basic reason why we had bigger showrooms where we wanted five cars display, 20 two wheeler display. So that once the customer walks in, he's able to see every uh, variant or a model we have. And it, it, it actually excites him to buy that vehicle. So only digital, only on a screen, uh, you don't get the exact feeling. So I feel, uh, as fast as possible, we can have an electric vehicle, even two-wheeler, three-wheeler or passenger vehicle, specifically a two-wheeler. Dealers present in most of the capital towns, most of the tier one towns, I feel the, uh, the numbers will grow huge. And the uh, resistance or the confusion, uh, whatever is there in the mind of customers can be easily avoided. So uh, for two-wheeler, actually, uh, normally a customer tries what? 30 to 50, 70 kilometers per day. So the charging infrastructure is actually not needed. 
it's just as in his, in his mind that if i am stuck somewhere in traffic or if my scooter is out of battery what will happen so it's similar with your uh, ice engine also you can go out of fuel sometime wherever if you are moving out or or you can uh, even uh, go through a breakdown so it's it's a similar thing an ice two wheeler or a ev two wheeler they are both similar if you talk of so if if a uh, an ice two wheeler has a capacity of 8 and a half or a 10 liter uh, uh fuel you know the capacity it will go to 400 km or 500 km or 300 km so if you have an electric vehicle you know the capacity there also you manage with that capacity so i agree uh, information communication is more required and additionally more people are involved more dealerships involved is more required so i'm seeing like uh, if you see all the uh, this ev have seen a flurry of new entrants but the mainstream uh, two wheeler oems have been a bit shying on it so they are bullish but they are bullish on a different scale they are they are investing in other oems or something like it so like bajaj launched chetak but they are not interested to go through a normal ice uh, two wheeler dealership but they have they have around 800 to 900 dealership but they are thinking of opening new dealership so uh, where the customer is you are wanting to go to a different setup so that's a different thing so today what is happening you have a gasoline vehicle you have a uh, diesel vehicle you have an cng vehicle you have an lpg vehicle but all being sold in one dealership so why not another fifth ev vehicle so if that happens the customer gets the choice he is able to make a decision that is uh, as per his need and that will help uh, i feel uh, getting this uh, electric vehicle percentage of the market share growing uh, in a big way because you know as of today it's still below 1% uh, you were right the registrations are good so we have already crossed uh, uh, last year figure so it's already 12000 plus than last year figure and i am expecting this year will be three times if i talk of the calendar year this will be three times the last year so that's a big jump on the whole but the base is too small so uh, uh, like solaja ji said we have to the full full team uh, from starting from dealership to the component manufacturers and the manufacturers will have to come and focus on this thing to make it a big in future thanks uh, thank amit ji can i say something here yeah, please Very please go on point yeah point that mr gulati made um you know uh, you know you know i've been in the automobile market for many for a long time so working very closely with dealers over the years so you know i have a suggestion and i agree with you you know there is this dilemma amongst the automobile dealers because they want to protect what they're selling so there is a infighting or you know bad mouthing of electric scooters but they know that electric scooters are coming at the same time the existing oems are not giving them the products so they are in a kind of a fix what to do so my uh, appeal or suggestion to all the members of pada and the dealers is that i think you know you have been in the market for very long and you have now seen and i'm sure you are all convinced that the time for electric vehicles has come it's a not question of if but when right so uh, as long as you're selling a lot of ice scooters are from a showroom it's difficult to sell a new product because you know there is this whatever conflict and you know selling 100 versus selling 10 for that selling the 10 you will not make the effort your team will not make the effort so the 100 will keep getting sold and you know you will never be part of the 10 um so my suggestion would be that the existing automobile dealers should honestly jump on the electric bandwagon sooner than later um and join hands with companies which are making electric vehicles there's already a, a system in automobile uh, business that you know typically uh, dealerships are taken in multiple names cousins you know uh, other family members people expand from two wheelers into three wheelers into four wheelers etc so why not expand into electric vehicles because otherwise other people other entrepreneurs will come and take electric vehicle dealerships and when the market will grow you as the leading for at the forefront of automobile dealership business then may have to start from a little bit of a, you know disadvantage so i think the opportunity is there and uh, uh, good companies like us and so many others are looking for good uh, partners and i think automobile dealers should jump on this bandwagon sooner than later and maybe have a new showroom or you know join hands with uh, electric vehicle manufacturers and get started because this opportunity is here and now you know not 5 years later that's what i feel thank you sulajit ji thanks for uh, pointing out uh, this uh, uh, this important uh, important point 
uh, one of the key observation that personally we have is uh, you know the kind of market is uh, the size of market is uh, pretty low as of now that uh, mr bulati just pointed out but apart from that there are also you know kind of resistance from the investors just because uh, because of the thin margins and the overall i would say sustainability stand that's a big question in uh, in the electric vehicle segment we have been you know observing many electric uh, uh, two wheelers you know recent in the recent past have have closed uh, some of big big showrooms some of those are uh, coming up with experience centers and everything so i think that there has to be some rational so i think that learning has to become has to come uh, in the new players so that is very very important so coming coming to you mr jitendra sharma ji uh, so sharma ji you have uh, you have a very very established brand now so what will be your future retail strategy you know when i think uh, solaja pointed out a very very interesting point when these big biggies comes into the into the picture of course Uh, it will be uh, like mr gulati pointed out 15000 versus like 400 500 or dealerships so how you are going to protect your interest and what will be your retail strategy going forward uh, retail strategy means uh, what i uh, would like to emphasize you on please is uh, primarily the retail formats you are going to adapt what will be your uh, and what will be your sustainability i would say uh, uh, overall approach towards your uh, towards your network okay amit if you see like as on today in the automobile industry the main face is the dealership pattern of course there is a new versions are coming for selling the product online selling or maybe offline also but at the end of the day the buying of a two wheeler or the three or four wheeler is always a family decision because when you run the vehicle on the road is is a matter of safety so person has to check the vehicle first the understand what is the performance of a product what are the safety factor in built in the product whether it's good for him for his sustainability for his whether it's uh, available for him is for his allows his pocket for everyday expenses versus ic also but the main format is always for automobile is the dealership and for that of course as okinawa we already have a pan india presence for more than, more than 300 dealerships and we are selling also online also but this online pattern is just for the booking process we do delivery from our dealerships because as you already said because of the some low margin in the dealership i think if the company like us or maybe new company which are coming coming up if they do the direct selling of these so what will be the uh, dealers margin how we take care of our dealers because they, at the end of the day they are the face of the companies and they as a stakeholder all these people we have to take care about their margin their sustainability and of course end of the day what is we are delivering at the end of the day to the customer the drivability experience because experience is very important in terms of ev once you touch and feel you drive the vehicle then only you understand you can compare very easily ic engine versus ev what are the benefit of ev like for example there is no noise in the ev noise pollution is nothing but of course and the uh, and second thing is the running cost is almost one tenth of the ic engine so if the people come to the dealership they come and experience the ev i think it will be more sustainable for the dealer perspective for the company perspective and of course for the customer experience also because today as you already everybody knows that india is one of the biggest market we sell more than 20 millions of ic two wheeler and by the same time ev is less than 1% how to make the uh, this market more grow in the future and how to make the electrification of this automobile industry this is only possible once the customer understand how the ev behaves how it works what is the experience when they drive it so finally end of the day i think the offline sale through the dealership is always better and sustainable for the future for dealership for the oems and for the customer also because if something problem coming for the service is some because this is a new technology the new innovation is coming every day in the ev ev sector if something went wrong with their vehicle what they have to do this type of myth is already in the customer's mind so as a company we have to break those myth because awareness is a very important and this is also one of the you can say today scenario where which is the barrier big barrier for the ev to sell because people have different perception about the ev their uh, you can say what how to charge the product what is the performance of the product what is the loading capacity so what is the range anxiety speed there lots of things and i think for the dealership 
if it is properly addressed to the consumer i think customer will go for it and uh, okinawa is always follows the what is the till if you see the history of the all the automobile i think through the dealership is the always a profitable business for the customer for the company and for the customer point of view for their sustainability so circling back to the original question uh, uh, from uh, uh, from sulacha ji here uh, she talked about that the traditional uh, dealer should come forward and uh, and and they should participate into the into the ev programs so what are the you know checks you guy you have as a, as a, as an entrepreneur as open about what are the checks you have that ensures the sustainability of a dealer that motivates them to probably you know participate and and start business with the okinawa so what are those checks how you will ensure the sustainability one is on the customer end and consumer side one is that part but how you how to how do you ensure the sustainability of your of your network and and your partner if you see when we compare about actually this is one of the myth also about the ev when the people talk about the ev for the dealers their viability i think the difference between ev and ic is the service part and it is not like that ki in the ev product also there is no service available requirement because it's uh, more or less is a more electric versus electronic vehicle you have to take care very uh, properly you should know what are the pros and cons of the serviceability of the product because in the ic if you see when you do the uh, service of the ic engine the difference between is the engine part where you have to change the filters you have to do change the engine oils or something but apart from this if you talk about the margin for the dealer for their sustainability they are taking good amount of margin when they do the sale of the vehicle they have to sell the accessories also the same thing which is happening in the ic engine they they have to do the service also but of course the service part is engine oil is not is not there but there is other variable uh, parts is also there when there is a brake pads or the brake shoes brake cables or variability and other things also happening in the ev also the if you see about the battery you have to take care of the battery also you have to do the charging the charging of the batteries also so it is about the knowledge how much the people aware about that you have to take care of your product so of course there is a only the myth about that if you talk about the ic there is a lots of margin is available for the dealers but if you see as on today you compare any big players where they are selling the product for the customers so the margin for their uh, selling time i think the the what ev is giving to our dealers like we are giving to our dealers the profitability is more on the selling part because we understand because it is a matter of demand and supply because the numbers are very less we have to take care of our dealers so for that okinawa is always take care about stakeholders we understand this is going to be the future because they are a part of our family we have to take care very carefully our dealers and if you do that i think this market is going to be the change over from ic to ev in future so if the dealers are is a very key partner for any oem so we have to take care in terms of selling margin for them of course the providing the spare parts to them on the right time if something problem happen they must have the spare parts at their dealership so take care the customer very well because when they sell the spare parts after the warranty they have to get the margin also so difference between ic and this is not so big it's about the perception only and i think with the uh, with the time the people know about the awareness i think this all myth will going to break and people will adopt for ev very frequently and you will see that time will change very be another down the line 2 3 4 years you will see a drastic change in this automobile industry and that's way okinawa take care of our dealers in a in a just like a family rakesh okay, so your take on uh, on the sustainability and viability of ev ev channels so amit uh, uh, i feel uh, it's still a challenge no doubt jitendra ji has given a right uh, perspective uh, uh, no doubt the service uh, is not as uh, uh viable as compared to ice because there are a lot of equipment a uh, lot of uh, parts which had to be replaced oil a lot of things where we earn a lot when we service an ice but uh, yes uh, uh, while selling we have a better margin uh, as uh, jitend ji said i don't know about all the oems but uh, some i am aware of that uh, they give uh, more margins on the sales side Uh, the problem is that uh, uh, the numbers have to be huge if you want to become survive regularly so as of today we see ev going up and down because of the 
local government uh, schemes. Uh, so one thing is always in mind, what will happen once the state schemes are over or the fame schemes are over? Will we be able to sustain? Because whenever a dealership is open, it opens minimum for five years or 10 years thinking in mind, investing around good amount in infrastructure, CII, everything. So uh, no doubt it's, it's a business decision for anybody who is joining in. Uh, but uh, yes, there, there is the perception, like Jitendji said, is there that uh, whenever we have talked about, we have always said that there are 1,000 parts in a nice engine and there are only 30 or a 300 or 100 parts in. Uh, so that is where a dealer is skeptical about that, how will I manage things? And uh, frankly, the kind of uh, pressure or focus on EV is, while selling, you are not able to uh, get a lot of additional revenues as compared to ICE. There are a lot of options there. So the registration is free uh, in most of the states in uh, EV. Uh, the insurance is also very, very uh, nominal as compared to ICE. So, so margins from all the additional revenues are less. So no doubt that has been covered by the OEMs by increasing margin. But uh, think is for a dealership, it is important to have a higher turnover to earn more. Uh, than to have a less turnover and uh, have more margin. So that's that's a combination where we have to think of investing today, uh, expecting. See, EV has to grow, no doubt. There is, there is like Sulajja ji said, it's when. And uh, as a dealer, we are expecting it shouldn't be uh, two years down the line or four years down the line. We are expecting max six months or one year because the kind of increase what we have seen as compared to last year, even it grows like this. So one thing also we should consider that uh, the EV is growing three times for last year, but it is growing mainly in the only in 10 cities in India. So it is not India which is growing. So if you talk about Bangalore, Pune, Delhi, Chennai are the four major cities which are showing the EV growth. Rest the numbers are so less that it's not even important to talk about. So I feel, like I said, the presence in uh, all towns is important to have that growth faster. So if we have dealership at all level, I'm not taking tier two, tier three town, but at least till tier one town, we'll see better growth happening. And uh, and uh, the percolation or uh, getting the EV in a faster speed will be easy for us. Um, Amitji, can I add a couple of things here on this? Well, just just one point I wanted to make, uh, and uh, then you can go ahead. So uh, I think one of the very important uh, factors that uh, Vinkesh ji actually pointed out here is is the absorption ratio, service absorption ratio, which actually covers your uh, a good amount of your running expenses in EVs are literally poor. That's one of the key area. That's why means the investors are shy, shying away. So definitely, uh, you know, kind of OEMs like you, Sulajaji, definitely you need to have programs, something which is much more elaborated, like partner onboarding program. Instead of partner onboarding program, you need to really think of, of programs like which is more of partner adoption program. From You have to really uh, means emerge from POP to PAP, something like that. So that, that barrier in mind, uh, our, our co means doesn't stay there and people come forward and invest into EVs uh, and associate with the e EV manufacturers. Right. Yeah. No, so I just wanted to make a comment, you know, it's a very interesting debate. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as both the co panelists said, you know, dealerships are the most important family members for automobile business because that's the first, you know, point of uh, contact for the customer. You know, and that's where the actual sale happens is the moment of truth is there, you know, not in the corporate boardrooms. Um, so one point I want to make is that uh, while it is true that the EV numbers are today lower, right, as, as all of us said, uh, why the EV dealerships are attractive, in my opinion, one, of course, the margins are higher if you look at percentage margins. And the way EV prices are going down, um, I think you know, OEMs will be able to offer higher margins to partners for a long time. Because, you know, for the customer, the price parity will come and in fact, prices are going to be more and more attractive with falling battery prices. So there'll be room for good margin. But secondly, you have to also look at the investments required for EV dealership versus ICE dealership. But if you go to one of the ICE two-wheeler, three-wheeler, four-wheeler, whatever manufacturers, they're asking for huge showrooms, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 square foot showrooms, equal size workshops, overheads, much higher. Whereas today an EV dealership is available for a much, much lower investment. 
uh, you know, in terms of size of the showroom, size of the workshop, because the population is less, um, amount of working capital. So the ROI on an EV dealership uh, is definitely very attractive. And what we are seeing is that a lot of young entrepreneurs are coming forward to become EV dealers because they are believing that this is the future and they have innovative ideas. And they could earlier never think of becoming automobile dealers because automobile dealership requires huge investment. You need a big showroom in a prominent area. And, uh, you know, it was almost like a domain of, you know, uh, the people with real estate. If you take a showroom on rental, you know, it's too expensive. Viability doesn't come, you know, all of that. But EV dealership is an opportunity for new entrepreneurs as well because the investments are lower. So new mindsets, new opportunities, new business models. So what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, it's a time of disruption. It is not going to be, EV is not going to be just an addition to what is going on. It might lead to a complete disruption in the entire automotive sector. Today, there are thousands of uh, automobile part companies. You know, as you said, there are thousands of parts, whereas there are only fewer parts in EV. What are all those autocom manufacturers going to do? Those who are supplying engine uh, components, right? They are going to have to revamp, rethink their business models in the future. Uh, similarly, even for the dealerships, right? It's a time of massive change. New format dealerships, as you said, you know, supported by experience centers, supported by online. In place of servicing, there's going to be charging, battery swapping, you know, mobility solutions. Why are automobile dealers can't offer mobility solutions? You know? Today, there's a good demand from e-commerce companies for delivery partners. And you, know, you can think about changing the mindset from only sales to also becoming kind of a service provider. You can have charging infrastructure, you can have battery swapping stations, you can have delivery operations. All of these are very very, very profitable in the EV format because there's an arbitrage. Your cost is one-tenth, but the price you're going to get from the customer is the same. So I think automobile dealerships and their business models will also undergo change. And certainly with the lower investments, EV dealerships even today have very low uh, break-evens and they are going to be very profitable businesses. This is what I feel. Just adding my thoughts on this debate. Sure, thanks. Yeah, so I think you have made some of very, very interesting, uh, you know, uh, points here, uh, having lower uh, working capitals and having those uh, lower investments. But I think that is uh, one of the statements, which is, to me, it's contradictory uh, as an outsider, because some of uh, some of EV manufacturers may require a lower investment, but some of them are really looking forward uh, for a big experience center uh, from the investor. So I think it is it is strategic company to company strategy, which is varying as of now, which is nothing fixed. And uh, some of uh, you know EV manufacturers are completely going with those traditional uh, say models of having the bricks and modular model, whereas some of them are coming up with a combination of online, offline, and everything. So I think it depends company to company. It it, it is completely a, a call of investor how how they associate with the with the manufacturers. One of the things that uh, that comes to everyone's mind, including us, uh, is uh, is is what happens when uh, the traditional uh, OEMs comes into this territory. They enter into this territory, and all of a sudden, like biggies, like heroes and Suzuki's and uh, and Bajaj and everything. Uh, naturally, uh, from my experience, of course, uh, they are selling it uh, in a separate, say, a part of showroom not a separate showroom really, it is extension of that showroom. But what will happen to, uh, to our sustainability? What, is, what will be our retail strategy? Uh, how we are going to protect the interest of our investors as well as how we are going to protect ourselves uh, going forward, uh, Jitendra ji, what is your take on that? Yeah. So Amit, if you talk about like when the big players are coming, of course, as I told you, this is a new technology. For the new technology also, it is a new for the, these big players also. It's a, because it's not an IC, it's not a legacy, uh, you can say business or other things which are coming from the generations. When we talk about this electric vehicles, you have a lots of, you can say examples in the past, if you talk about smartphone to the other phone, the technology has changed. So where are the, those big players like Nokia and other things? Nobody knows now today. So it depends upon the adoption and the, you can say that what the product you are offering to your consumer as a company, as a stakeholder, if you understand the need of a consumer and you are giving in the proper services, proper product, as per their expectations, the pricing of the product, right price at the good quality and uh, after sales service. I think these are the key things because now the generation is changing. It's not like that maybe 30 years ago, 20 years ago, we have to stuck to the only the one brand. So we have to go with that only. 
so now the things are changing as the new generations are coming they want to take the risk they want to adopt the new things like in terms of the technology when the new technology is coming the new innovation is coming because and the second part of this industry is the size the pie is so big if you see today the 20 million uh, down the line after 5 years i think this market is going to be 26 27 million so it is a scope for everyone to grow it is not like that only if the big player will coming they will grab the complete market it is not anywhere in the world if you see anywhere in the world if you see the example of china as on today china last year sold uh, around 45 million vehicles of ev and ic is around 1 million okay so if you see sorry 10 million so if you see the overall market of the china which is captured by all the big players in china they all are the new one they all are the startups there is no traditional player if you see all the big international players is available in china honda suzuki kawasaki all are available but they are not in that market so it is it is a question of the adoption how the customer adopt your product and as a company as a oem what products you are offering to your consumer because as on today when you talk about ev consumer the main thing is they always compare your ev with the ic engine in terms of the performance in terms of the quality in terms of the running cost upfront cost finance insurance all these parameters when they compare with that and and, and now if you see already the petrol prices already increased so this is the second story for how the ev will grow but when talk about the new big player will come i think it's a question of sustainability what product you are offering to your consumer that is very important and what technology as i told you technology is new for everyone it depends upon the oem how they adopt it how they this this will uh, circulate to your consumer and this is very important part i think it is a big place to sustain everyone in this market because okay, so your take on especially on uh, one of interesting point that jitendra ji made here that the brand loyalty or that that brand element goes for a toss when ev comes what's your take from the ground from the customer uh, consumer stand still in a very nascent stage to comment on that uh, but uh, what you have seen in uh, electric three wheeler so you saw a lot of chinese product come in lot of local manufacturer come in slowly and steadily they wide off and now there are still some left but uh, companies who are a brand like mahindra has come into it and there are other companies coming into it so they are continuing so i am not talking about uh, ether okinawa hero electric or ampia they will continue because they have they have established themselves but leave apart these four or five there are at least 100 electric two wheeler manufacturer who are selling today i doubt they will be able to continue so uh, uh, it's right what jitendra ji is saying but uh, yes whenever uh, the big four will come the market disruption will have a bigger percentage growth so uh, i'll just give you an additional data on this see if you see the biggest city for electric two wheeler registration or sale is bangalore only and there is no other city which is even half of it so bangalore has done from jan to july till date 5400 next is pune which is 2300 then delhi 1700 so with the current team of oems who are doing electric two wheelers i know this is a disruption this is a new technology that is okay we are talking about this for 5 years every day we are getting something new in this the kind of products being launched by okinawa ether hero electric they are they are pretty good and with the fame to support uh, uh, and uh, fame to uh, focus on indian indianization on the product this is this is this is the improvement what we look at but but i feel we need uh, or one of the four uh, current evs to become big i don't know about how ola electric is doing i'm not i don't know the details so i'm not commenting but one of the four or five current uh, oems becoming big and being present everywhere so if we talk of the only one city doing such a big number and others lagging behind it means the what i was saying the distribution system is is needs a change i'm not saying plot because uh, whosoever came into ev two wheeler came thinking how the which cities customer will adapt faster so obviously bangalore hyderabad pune those are all teenager based and they 
they go to uh, all these uh, latest disruptions while you go towards north people will wait let's see how the vehicle goes in the service is there or not what's the resale price there are a lot of questions when a north indian north uh, zone uh, customer buys it so i feel now it's a time that we expand uh, with whatever uh, uh, capacity we have and be present everywhere so uh, not wait for the big four to come in and expand and take over the uh, pie because the availability at all location is the most important thing to sell so even today if you check on like the number of dealer hero has or number of dealer suzuki has right. you are clear that uh, if suzuki even expands to a level it cannot reach that number because the presence is less so right that is very clear and that has gone through what 30 40 years auto dealerships auto retail is happening in india right so reach is really really important and in fact uh, which is which is why i think the numbers that we are seeing are just limited to certain cities and certain clusters but i think one of the very very important uh, important thing that you talked about was the sustainability of those and probably going forward we can expect some of consolidations happening or maybe some of those synergies the strategic synergies and all all those things coming in into the picture sulaja ji uh, uh yeah sorry so sulaja ji your take on on that consolidation stuff especially and going forward how do you see really some synergies coming in uh, and some consolidations happening in this space because the number of uh, number of players are too much definitely and they definitely number one of course it is not just because of the financial stability but also from that uh, uh that knowledge transfer stuff so that is really really important and to me i think it is not just between the technology you know that knowledge transfer it is also towards from between the oem and dealers there has to be a sync because from my personal experience whenever we go to the go to the dealership there is a clear cut statement which comes to you without asking so what you want to buy that ev so there will be clear cut statement that started with the range so that knowledge transfer the skilling is also very very important so those synergies and consolidations what is your take on that so i think that certainly we are at an interesting point uh, in the sector now and a lot of action is you know expected here onwards uh, today tesla is the world's most valuable automobile company you know more than uh, volkswagen and gm etc though it's much smaller so there's certainly a lot of excitement about the ev technology Uh, at the same time i do believe that uh, uh, you know part of me wants to say that look this is disruption so it's chance for new heroes to be born and like we gave got the example of china where the top 20 electric two wheeler companies not even one of them are from the top 20 ice two wheeler companies right so completely new leaders have been born you have people like ola for example in india who are entering two wheeler market though they are not even automobile oems so i think that it will be a bit of both i think there will be some companies who start up as uh, you know pure play ev companies who would be able to uh, really scale up and you know become very successful who have unique positioning unique advantages um at the same time there are some ev startups you know who may falter because startup is very different from a full scale automobile business uh, automobile business requires um, knowledge of everything from design to manufacturing supply chain uh dealership network brand building servicing spare part warranty it's a very involved business and customer safety is involved customer brand image is important so not all small startups can really you know uh, achieve that kind of a scale up they may end up partnering with some other players they may be consolidation that could also happen i could also say that you know we can also probably think that some of the larger automobile companies who have to undergo a complete transformation from existing business model to ev not all of them may make it and right? many of them have huge investments in their own backward integration supply chain which could become redundant you have existing cost structures you have permanent workmen you have uh, in investments depreciation interest costs and not for everybody this whole transition to a new business model you know is going to be uh, smooth sailing so there will be a lot more action going forward you know they that said you know there could be all kinds of things some new heroes some consolidation and you could even see some biggies fail like look at the phones we were talking about sharma ji was saying about smartphones you know there was nokia there was uh, motorola there was blackberry today in smartphones 
there are completely new leaders there's apple and you know there is shami and others so not everybody has been able to make the transition smoothly so i think there will be a lot more excitement going forward new heroes and and probably some you know um, consolidation some faltering as well so it's going to be an interesting time perfect any comments on your retail strategy going forward how you you are planning to have your retail strategy this is going to be a, a means a completely online offline or mix of it how you are planning to have your retail strategy uh, so let's uh, for kinetic we have an edge kinetic green that you know we have a very established brand name kinetic is a, one of the most respected brand names in automobile business so we are able to attract good uh, dealership partners you know because there is a reliability of the brand in the market um secondly we are very focused on our strategy we are going to be a light mobility company so three wheelers of course we are one of the leading players we have passenger and cargo solutions and we are now you know making uh, a larger play into the two wheeler space so focus is on three and two wheelers um and what we have decided is to adopt this and also just to say one more thing you know uh, we were discussing about big city versus small city earlier we are in fact seeing a growing response to electric two wheelers in small cities now uh, because in small cities customers are more value conscious they are driving even smaller distances and they are able to understand the value of electric vehicles because they are able to see that there is less petrol cost and the range is just adequate for their they don't need huge speeds um so i am actually uh, believing that there will be larger penetration in the smaller towns uh, you know as as we go forward they will pick up on this format uh, much more quickly than we can imagine um so we are looking at a strategy where i think physical infrastructure is important for automobile because customers have to do a touch and feel they have to take test ride they need to go in for servicing so dealership network is very very critical it can always be augmented with virtual showrooms experience centers you know some of those things you know to kind of create more uh, excitement um but we are going for smaller format showrooms we believe that uh, you know it's we have to be practical that yes dealers will be willing to bleed a little bit invest for the future a little bit but you have to show them the ability to you know break even in a certain period of time and uh, today even retail is changing quite rapidly so we don't need to invest in huge showrooms and huge workshops where you know there will be a lot of dealer mortality um, and we have to take care of the roi so maybe one can always begin with a smaller format showroom and then expand into larger format uh, showrooms you know as the business builds up so practical approach is what we are taking Jitan ji, your your take on especially on the on the potential mapping and when can you onboard uh, your your partners? What are the key things uh, you you take care for their sustainability stand? Especially potential mapping, uh, how because that's very very important. But as of now, because of because of availability of data, I think how do you ensure that they are uh, sustainable in in future uh, from from the viability stand? one is the potential mapping but also the territory planning so how do you how do you see those things uh, coming into your uh, especially uh, your kind of a business because those things will definitely play a very very critical role when it comes to the futurist futuristic sustainability of your network and as you said i think because definitely dealers are the backbone of your business so how do you see i think these two things coming into into, into your overall planning stuff and how do you ensure that the knowledge transfer is happening from the process side people side and profitability side because personally what we have felt uh, what we have experienced so far that there is lot of lot of skill transfer that need to be done on the uh, electric vehicle dealership as of now uh, the skill enhancement has to be there because you don't really find those skilled people who can really sell because selling is selling skills are very different compared to the selling skill of ic engine and and an electric vehicle engine expectations of the customer are very different so how do you ensure that uh, you have those knowledge transfers like amit if you see like india geographically is a very big uh, place so as mr gulati also rightly said because for the dealer penetration is very important for selling an or any automobile brand whether hero suzuki honda anyone and same way as okinawa we are also planning in that way as currently we have more than 300 dealerships and we also understand like whether it's a tier 1 metro or tier 2 city because as what ms suleja ji has said of course like ev attraction is also coming very good in the tier 2 city because the value of the money in the tier 2 tier 3 city is more as compared to the metro city where the 100 rupees note values to that 
tier two person, tier three, as compared to the metro, is is a basic difference between that. They understand the value of that. So for that, the running cost, the EV, they understand very well because end of the day, they are saving their money, their pocket money. So that is this is one part. Of course, for the dealership perspective, the most important thing is how to penetrate in the more cities, more rural area, or maybe urban area, or maybe you can say the remote area also. Because once you penetrate in that area, you can give the awareness about your product to your customers. And basically, it's your dealers who are the front liner. For example, like Okinawa strategy, we always says our dealers. Once you make a good dealership, as per our CI norms and VI norms, then they can go for the sub dealership also. And same way for the you can say sale point also, where they can display the product. Because as of today, even the customer, because the population of India is so big, the geographical part of India is so big. People don't know which company are available, which good product is available in in India for the EV. Because of course the government is also giving lots of awareness section. Like if you see lots of another Go Electric, Switch Delhi, another mood campaigns are coming. But the people who are living in the rural area, whether they know about that or no, that's why the technology transformation is very important as a OEM. So for that, like in Okinawa, we have a dedicatedly have a separate cell for the training cell who give the training for our dealerships we call the people to our our factory to for the training we have a regular training session with online because last two years everybody knows because of this covid we do the training session on the regular basis to our dealer they understand the technology and this technology they have to transfer to their sub dealers to their maybe mechanics or maybe for the customers also how to take care of this product because a lot lots of time the people don't understand how to take care and sometimes they abuse this product and that's why the problem comes in then they said this is a bad product so training and that uh, you can say technology transformation is very important role in the ev especially for ev because ic is a mature market it's it's already available for more than 100 years so everybody knows is some problem how to set the carburetor like if some problem happen if you seen 20 years back when the, some scooter has uh, not starting we have to do the kicking, we have to do uh, setting the carburetor and you just start the scooter. So this of technology already everybody knows, but EV is a new technology. So technology transformation is very important as a OEM. And this transformation starts from OEM to the dealers, to sub dealer. And of course, at the end, the user consumer is very important. And that's why we already, as I told you, dedicatedly, we have a training cells. They train the people or repeatedly every time they have to tell some new thing is coming in our product some new product is launching we have to give a training for that new product first and then only we can go for the launching we have to send those product to the to the dealership otherwise if something new comes to the dealership they don't know how to take care what some problem comes how to take care of that problem then it will become the become the dealers or the mechanics become negative about that product so that is very important uh, like uh, yeah, you can say technology transformation and of course the penetration is the second part which is also primarily very important to penetrate in the rural urban as well as the remote area also perfect thanks, thanks so much thanks. so amit can i ask a question to the panelist yeah please so uh, to both uh, Jitenji and Sulaja ji, when do you expect that an electric vehicle two-wheeler price will match the ICE two-wheeler price? Okay. You have some so, period. So can I ha say? Speak up. Or you? Yeah, okay. Thank you. So Ms., uh, Mr. Gulati, it's always like chicken egg story because it's a demand and supply. Because if you see now today is only 1% apart from these 20 million vehicles. So we have to see once the market will grow and as on today, when there is a lots of, you can say push from the government side also, awareness is coming, people understand how the EV market is going to happen and it's a technology for the future. So what is, why the cost is too high? Even if I say about the, whether it's a fame to how long it will be sustained for next three years, four years, five years. If you ask me as an OEM, I think it is not required. Why? If, does, if the demand is more, if the volume is coming, automatically the cost of the component goes down. In the IC engine, there is no subsidy. Why we talk about subsidy? Of course, for initial years, now it is good. We have to promote this industry. People understand 
people will go for it but i think later on after 3 4 years i think it doesn't required when the component cost it goes down it will of course match the cost of the ic engine and of course after bs6 the cost of ic is already increased if you see compare with that but that is the benefit in the ev there is no bs4 bs6 no regulation because it's always already pollution free so i think down the line 2 3 4 years once the demand is there of course the supply will also automatically reduces their prices and of course as on today if you see the localization pattern of india of the supply chain is already increase for in our case we are already more than 90% 92% localized parts so now the supply chain is already coming in a big way for india and for all other oems is also coming in a big way to make this product localized so the cost of the company goes down in the near future very soon now so let's up to you okay so um um let me address it both ways right uh, one is on the what is the current pricing structure you know where the industry is and what are the trends and also talk about the subsidy aspect so today if i look at so there are three kinds of vehicles in the market one is a low speed non pain compliant which are mostly import based then you have the medium speed pain compliant the speeds are around 45 but the vehicles are under fame so they are getting the subsidy and then you have the high speed family scooters which are like let's say or high performance let's call them like the <coughs> ether or you have uh, the chetak and iq these kind of vehicles right um so on all three if you look at the lower speed vehicles right uh, they there is a range available from around 59000 rupees Uh, so this uh, you know it is already and let's look at the cost of scooters today in the market right you know an activa or a jupiter or a maestro is now costing between 85 to 90000 after rto and everything is done am i right about the range yeah right 87 88 89000 89, is the cost plus you are spending about 100 rupees a day on petrol if you look at 60 kilometers run right that means you are spending another 1 and 1 lakh plus rupees in the next three years on petrol so your total cost for 3 years is much much higher you know it's double of what you are paying up front um so if you look at this low end scooters they are already much much cheaper of course you are have to compromise on speed and all that because the speed is uh, much slower so they are selling it to niche segments you know in small towns etc that segment will continue at that price point and it will remain niche then there is this whole mid, mid speed vehicles uh, which after the fame subsidy have become very attractive so their prices were around 70000 around 765 to 75 they have now come down to between 55 and 65 so those are also very attractive compared to ice vehicles because again you look at a smaller town look at an aurangabad satara look at a moradabad whatever you are getting an electric scooter of decent performance 45000 rupees uh, 45 uh, top speed a uh, good enough for your daily city run so this segment has now become very attractive cost along with battery is now around 60000 rupees compared to a 90000 of a ice vehicle so there will be many people especially in the smaller towns i think who will go for this mid speed format once the awareness builds you know once the dealership network penetration comes and these vehicles already have a higher level of localization so servicing is better reliability is better all of that so in this segment also is attractive now coming to the largest segment which is the high speed uh, high performance scooters which were around 1.3 1.4 lakhs i think after the fame uh, announcement they have come down to around 1.1 to 1.15 most of them right so actually if you look at 90000 versus 1.1 1.15 the gap is not much already and if you look at petrol cost you are going to recover this 20000 rupees gap within actually a quarter so those who can understand that that i'm spending a lakh i'm spending 90000 here but i don't have any petrol cost i have to spend only 3 units of electricity already are going to start making that choice and this gap also will continue reducing as the battery prices come down so we are buying batteries around 185 dollars per kilowatt hour today uh, it's expected that it, at around 10% a year will be the battery cost reduction so in about 12 months from today i'm imagining that with the current fame uh, subsidy status uh, vehicles of high performance scooters will be available sub 1 lakh somewhere between 90000 to 1 lakh rupees so then you have 90000 and 99000 then it's almost like price parity so i think we are not very far from this now two more things one is why the prices are little higher today and why the fame subsidy is needed i think the only reason really here one of course battery prices which are coming down when we started connecting green it was 750 dollars per kilowatt hour we are at 185 today already you know it's a massive uh, reduction 
and with more electric vehicles coming there will be more innovation batteries will become higher in density and the cost ex expected to come down to 150 in the next couple of years and 100 you know after maybe another couple of years um, so that will be a massive uh, change you know in, in the whole pricing structure batteries will become substantially cheaper so the whole economics will be completely different this is one reason. Secondly, because of there are not enough auto comps companies in India making electric vehicle parts. So whatever we are buying from local suppliers today, some of them were on your panel like TVS, Lucas, etc., etc. We are paying a premium for buying local parts. To the extent that after buying, if you buy from China, you pay the duty, you would pay the freight, you are still cheaper than if you buy from the Indian suppliers because they don't have volume. They are amortizing their investments over a smaller volume. So the moment volume picks up, the component cost will come down. And that will be another big boost for electric vehicle pricing. I think this same subsidy, therefore, will not be required after a couple of years once battery prices come down below $150 per kilowatt hour and component prices come down. So on, on its own, because of mass production and because of battery technology, EVs will be uh, you know, price parity or lower price than ICE vehicles. This is my perspective on this. So with your just, uh, answer, uh, just a minute, Amit. Yeah. So uh, within a couple of years, then the ICE manufacturers will have to start thinking of disruptions. Because I, when you are, uh, if it is goes down to 150 kilowatt or 100, obviously it will be cheaper than a, 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 a ICE two-wheeler. So they'll have to then innovate something to continue selling ICE vehicle, this means. So in my opinion, see, you can't keep a good thing down for too long. And that's what is what happening for EVs now, right? Um, and uh, I think that the ICE manufacturers are already jumping on the bandwagon. You know, they may not publicly announce yet, but I, I think everybody is working on electric vehicle platforms. Even Porsche is, Volkswagen is, uh, Mercedes is. Uh, you know, uh, they're all developing uh, BMW or developing EV platforms. So I think the revolution is here and now. It's just a couple of years, honestly. Thank you. Yeah. One of the one of the key observation I think that even the customers have beside the initial pi, uh, price penetration uh, is is the residual values. So what's your take on that? Because there is a customer end up you know comparing what I'm going to get after three years on in this and what I'm going to get. So it's all about TCU. Right. So as uh, Jitendraji said that you know rest of the vehicle, uh, if you keep the battery aside, it's like a nice vehicle. You still have the brake suspension for chassis, seats, lighting parts, etc. And as you have more reliable local component makers coming for the EV sector, reliability of the electric vehicles will increase. So Chinese imported parts vehicles are definitely not as reliable and as durable as the Indian vehicles because Indian manufacturers understand the requirement of durability, road conditions, vibrations, you know, all of that. We build our vehicles for much longer periods than for the Chinese companies. So there's a throw and use kind of a situation there. So I think as uh, Indian Optocom companies come forward and supply EV components, um, reliability will increase and you know people will stop importing uh, uh, parts from China. That will increase the resale value for sure uh, and give people confidence on resale value. And the second thing is batteries. You see, today you're buying a battery for an electric rickshaw, let's say, for 65,000 rupees. Now, as battery prices come down and they're coming down substantially, when that customer has to go and replace his battery after three to five years also, because people don't really use, you know, 80 kilometers a day, some of them use less. At that time, the price of the new battery will be much lower. Plus, that customer will get some price for his existing battery, you know, because there's a value for a stationary application. So, the pinch will be much, much less according to me. So even then, with the replacement of battery, the TCO for electric small vehicles, okay, it looks attractive. So when we are speaking today, we're talking about two-wheelers and three-wheelers, right? Car is a different ballgame altogether. Performance, charging, dealership, you know, everything is different there. But for the small format vehicles, for the green mobility, for the masses, which is the focus in India, I think these factors make the story of electric vehicles for two-wheelers and three-wheelers very compelling. Because of intra-city transport, lower size of uh, batteries, falling price of batteries, fame subsidy, government focus, uh, states focus. I think this is really accelerating the whole uh, deployment in the short run. 
Very interesting. Prerna, uh, uh, Prerna has joined us just now. So Prerna, uh, you know, we were discussing about uh, about uh, certain things like price parity. I think one of very interesting question that Mr. Gulati asked from us. So what is your take? Uh, You're on mute, Miss Miss Prerna. 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 So, Miss you are on mute. Thank you. Thank you very much, panelists, for please waiting for me and accommodating this delay, please. And uh, Jitendra ji, pleasure to see you after a long time. We are able to finally connect right here. Thank you, Amit. And uh, I'll just extrapolate from whatever uh, uh, Shalja was mentioning. I, I know the, the rising battery prices is, is, is the name of the game, but from the global perspective, Jitendra ji, I think going from the take from the last discussion we had on the subject, um, we, were, we were both of the common opinion that the world is, is coming into this, riding into this bandwagon and the entire world is looking at us to optimize on the economies of scale. And this is where the population is. The only, only another player which uh, would have given us competition in terms of the sheer size of consumer population was, of course, our neighborhood. And, and, and as luck would have it, China is, is sort of running out of favor for, for many reasons that have been discussed just now in the forum. The next available players who can optimize on the economies of scale remains India. And this is where we feel we have win-win almost all the quarters. We have a fantastic product. We have a position statement. We have the consumer base. And from most of the statistics, I'm sure as everybody has come through, 79% um, of the entire, entire automobile population is, is dominated by the two-wheeler segment. And um, if we were to corroborate the example from the telecom industry, this is where the price barrier is a little lower from the rest of the product segment. So if I were to experiment as a layman, starting my experience with an EV, starting from a car or from a bus, I would rather experiment it on a two-wheeler segment, wherein the entry cost is much, much lower. So from a consumer's perspective, if you look at it, it's much, much easier for them to put their bet on a product which is priced around 50, 60, 70,000 rupees, then to start experimenting with the product which is priced two and a half lakh rupees to five to 50. And this is where I feel the two wheelers have sort of broken the myth. They have introduced the customers and they have handheld the change. Uh, from the panelists, I know like, like Jitendra ji has already experienced this in, in many, many years, possibly much more than any of us put together in this domain. And he knows how a two-wheeler customer behaves and how easy or difficult is that to convince them six years before than it is now. So if you were again to, ex to corroborate the experience from the telecom experience of last two decades, when we were buying phones uh, in our generations, uh, let's say two, three decades before, we would first buy a phone for 10,000 rupees and see if that works. And if, if the cost of repairs or replacement is as heavy, is that easy, is that convenient or not? And these days, you just buy it for one and a half lakh rupees off an online site offering discount without waiting to touch and feel the product. Because we've already built that faith that, you know, a smartphone works. And you know, this is the cost to expect from a product which is going to offer you as much. This is the same sort of stage we are in, in this EV domain. So I guess the more we are able to collaborate and come together, and I think we all will be able, we all will be participants in this boat to be able to build a product wherein we all are cons convincing our own consumers and all our consumers put together are the consumers of this entire EV industry. If each of us are excellent in whatever else that we are doing, we are only aiding each other in economizing the product, in bringing the costs down. And this is where the world is looking at us. I think almost everybody is building the best of the BMSs, picking up the best of the batteries. Um, 
my personal experience is the kind of people who were um, who we wanted to associate with they were looking at us at a at a scan with a scanner whether uh, this product will do well in this domain at all or not but two three years down the line it is coming easy it is coming manageable it is coming uh, now we are not even looking at break even points now when you look at like like jitendra ji was mentioning getting an investor's perspective he has his hands on on that subject uh, whilst everybody was speculating when will you draw the roi line is it going to be in the first year or third year or five years quite like the ic segment how many hundreds of crores are you going to spend in are you looking at spending thousands of crores or 2000 these days it has come down to hundreds of crores that's the name of the game and this is where we feel we've already achieved a lot yeah, much thanks. much more than pardon me yeah sure yeah so we we've already achieved much much more in this segment compared to what any other industry would have benchmarked in this domain so i see that what the telecom and revolution in the way things had changed in about 10 to 20 years we in this industry would achieve in 5 years and this is where these days with the kind of investors interests people come in people are not suspecting your projections that this is how you would be able to achieve the roi this is where you will be able to get or get to a break even this is what is going to be the capex and is that actually warranted will people start to work these questions are sort of obviated now the 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 convincing part has already been done we we are sitting on an execution platter and i feel all the pointers are working in a in a positive direction for this industry and the kind of people who are joining this game now are all passionate enthusiastic tech savvy and 100% able that is where i feel we completed the loop of loop of uh, the ability and the willingness to be able to do it sure perfect thanks prerna uh, jitendra ji one of uh, one of the interesting question that has been asked from one of our panelist uh, how do you see model like uh, uh, model like agency model or something like mercedes that has started off in india with the with holding all the inventory cost on their own and potentially you know kind of uh, kind of giving a leverage to their investors you know growing faster with uh, with lesser i would say burdens from the uh, you know fixed investment side how do you see is there any possibility that the entrants of evs are also looking for those kind of retail models that's one and secondly also one of uh, our attendees wants to understand what are the financial finance options available because the finance options are very very limited for ev consumer precisely compared to those in uh, in in the ice engine side so what are what are what is your take on those two issues me about the first question like the mercedes has come up with this inventory cost less for their investor for the dealers i think this is a good business model but we have to see because like ev is a at a very nascent stage so and the people who are in this game actually that needs a lots of funding for that because if you want to take all the load on the oems and of course it will bring some maybe you can say attraction point for the dealers because they no need to invest anything they have to just invest in the services and once the buyers is there they have to just deliver the product and get the some benefit from by selling that product i think this is a new thing which is coming up by these big giants but for the ev it is very new things and i think it will take some time because that needs to be a very cash rich because it's at the starting point we have to be first uh, you can say profitable then we have the lots of cash flow issues also for all the companies because now everyone understand this uh, industry is new and we have to invest lots of thing in our localization things and we have to procuring all these things so i think it will take some time and it is not the right thing as on today for the ev and your uh, as you said about the your second question about the retail financing finance of course, of course now there is a lots of things were happening in this domain also earlier maybe one years back there was some issues where there is a few bankers are on board 
for financing these things but there is lots of new fintech companies are coming nbfcs are coming or even psu banks are also already there like you talk about okina we have more than 14 players on board which they are financing our product at our dealerships but some are psu banks some new fintech are coming coming uh, companies are coming and if you see these companies are coming with new technology within 10 minutes they will just check your everything uh, kyc everything and they can decide whether they will go for this financing or not so because of the technology innovation this new fintech company is a very good business model which is coming for ev as on today and of course government push the bank are also coming on board but there is a lots of new you can say journey is going to happen for this psu has to come because when you compare with ic engine the bottleneck compare with the ev is that the uh, percentage margin of the what the interest cost they are taking from the ev as compared to the ic second thing is when they decide for the uh, delinquency in the ev as compared to the ic the banks take the risk on the ic more because the volumes are more if there is they are selling for example one lakh vehicle they are retail financing and there is a delinquency of 1% or uh, there is a, some defaulter is there so they can take the risk very easily but when in case of ev if it is 1000 vehicle they are retail financing and there is a 1 percentage of the defaulter so they have to be takes a back seat for that whether they have to go for it or not but i think when the demand is increasing i think they have to come to finance this verticals in a big way sure perfect amit if i may add one more line to uh, this uh, jitendra ji like the the way you were saying uh, that uh, we we as the as the localization process increases i believe the supply chain partners are also very very supportive and very very collaborative in in terms of uh, supporting the working capital as well as the inventory needs so they are ready to house the inventory keep the ready and supply them in order to be able to make good the jet model almost all of them have come forward to support in this come so as the percentage of localization increases i am sure this challenge will also graduate obviated okay perfect one of uh, another question one of the question that one of our attendees has been asking i think uh, very much to in line what we discussed uh, a few minutes back uh, sulaja ji uh, regarding uh, that consolidation stuff and everything so one of the attendees wants to understand that how do you see this uh, uh, means sharing of those multi brand ev dealerships for an example of sharing multi brand in, in particular dealership what are your thoughts on that of course it's not that simple in india but what are, what's your thoughts so you know in uh, in india always or even globally honestly uh, mostly automobile showroom dealerships are exclusive they are not multi brand and this is because customers uh, would like to see authorized service you know this is very important for customers when they are buying a vehicle you have to understand that it's a big amount of the money they are putting in yes so service spare part you know it's very important top of their mind and they believe that an authorized company dealership will always offer me better service uh, better spare part better warranty support so this plays very top of mind people when they are buying an automobile so typically in automobiles uh, two wheeler all the way to four wheeler it's always been exclusive dealerships now i am seeing that in electric two wheelers there is a trend of some multi brand showrooms which have come up um and they are doing decent amount of business you know it's it's a new uh, business model that has come up so one has to wait and watch uh, it may be something which is a transient thing it's possible uh, you know as uh, you know there are multiple uh, Uh, formats available multiple models and less dealership as the sugulati was saying in terms of number of touch points for electric vehicles um right so but it could be something that is transient and a not sustainable in the long run but again you know it's a new industry uh different business models are evolving uh, and as we discussed the service needs for electric two wheelers are lower than that for a uh, ice vehicle it could even get sustained you know to some extent because you are sharing the infrastructure cost you know the, for that outlet right. infrastructure cost is limited they able to have multiple uh, format vehicles uh, somehow i would still think that the exclusive authorized dealerships uh, you know will 
have chunk of the business even if multi brand remains you know as a part of the ecosystem i don't think they will replace the authorized dealership because automobile is all about safety and uh, service also at the end of the day so so just to summarize thank you so much sumit ji uh, just to summarize uh, the discussion that we had a very very interesting discussions all the panelists and uh, i think just to summarize the discussion i think we we touch base the customer journey uh, we touch base that uh, the customer is becoming more and more aware there are a lot of efforts from the oem side uh, there are uh, of course there are efforts that need, need to be put from uh, from the skill enhancement point of view from oems to the to the touch points and to the dealers uh we also talked about uh, the formats uh, which naturally jitendra ji talked about a very very interesting point that it has to be a minimum uh, say investment to start with uh, so lajja ji also you know kind of supported the same point the initial investments are kept in mind when they are planning for the formats that's the key strategy that uh, that the, the, that the manufacturers are adapting they are highly conscious about the competition like olas of the world and and on the established player enter enter into the market what will be their sustainability model of course that's why they are try they are highly cautious putting in those high investments and those high capitals in place in big to start with and then finally we also talked about uh, those residual values and tcos and everything everything is is falling in place so let's see how this uh, how this industry emerges over a period of time so best of luck to all of you uh, uh, to panelists for for your uh, for your setups and uh, really look forward for a greener india uh, going forward so thank you so much for your uh, participation and over to you dipanshu thank you thank you amit for that uh, fascinating discussion and i the participation of all our panelists uh, mr gulati thank you uh, as always very very insightful thoughts mr sharma thank you for your perspectives uh, ms motwani ms chaturvedi thank you for your participation i truly appreciate and amit of course for conducting and very aptly and summing it up as well